So you are in for a real treat uh, <laughs> this evening. <laughs> Or maybe not. <laughs> That's a maniacal laugh. Uh, I am blessed to be able to welcome Mark Cousins to Virtual Futures. So my name is Luke Robert Mason, and I'm director of Virtual Futures. And for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian puts it, its actual aim, hidden behind the brush steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs and charismatic profits, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did or tried to do was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. The Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, we're joined by Mark Cousins, a filmmaker. Hey! <laughs> this is a good crowd. This is a really good crowd for us. All right, tonight we're joined by Mark Cousins, a filmmaker and critic. His new book, The Story of Looking, explores the role that looking has played in our emotional, social, political, scientific, and cultural development as human beings. It is quite simply an affirmation of something that most of us take for granted, the ability for the human eye to perceive that small spectrum of electromagnetic waves that give us access to the visible world. It is a personal book, and you certainly get that feel when you're reading it, and it's a road movie rather than a dinner party, and those are, those are Mark's words. It shifts between short and long timelines in the history of looking, both macro and micro. It is a book to be experienced rather than read. And our conversation tonight will be an interrogation of 21st century looking. The revelation that 30 billion selfie photographs are taken a year is a small part of a much larger story about how digital technology has changed our looking selves. So please take a moment to look away from your shiny, glowing, rectangular devices, and please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Mark Cousins to the Virtual Future stage. So Mark, my first question is, is why looking? I mean, what does looking mean to you? Why was it important, and why was it important to write this, this book? Uh, I think that looking has made me happy. Simple as that. You know, it, uh, uh, that's a short answer. Uh, when I was a kid, I was a pretty rubbish reader, really slow reader. But I looking was when I looked at pictures, picture books, I felt as if I was diving into a swimming pool. It's funny, just as I say that, last night at two o'clock in the morning, I was in Bristol and I looked into the river, muddy, yucky river, and I, and it just said, dive in. And there was something about looking at it and so I dove or dived in. Um, so that kind of, that kind of the, the encounter with the visual world has always taken me out of myself. There's this lovely phrase, the rapture of self-loss. And I feel that looking has always stopped me being stuck in my own head, as it were. Uh, it's funny, walking down here today, I was thinking of um, a piece of writing rather than looking that uh, Virginia Woolf wrote. It's called um, Street Haunting. It's a beautiful essay. Some of you might know it. And she's talking about walking th down Regent Street. Uh, anybody know it, this piece of writing? Yeah. yeah. And isn't it brilliant? Yeah, thank you. Um, and she's walking down Regent Street. I think it's Regent Street and it's a November evening and she's decided she's invented a reason to go out. She's been in a room, a room of her own, and she's a bit stuck in her own head. And so she goes out to buy a pencil. She doesn't need a pencil, isn't that right? But she goes and buys one. And in the process of having this ulterior motive, she walks down through London as the sun sets. Uh, uh, one November day, she describes it beautifully and she looks at homeless people and she engages with them in that moment where the light from the fancy shops spills across them and she's looking into the eyes of other human beings and she's looking around London and she's having this experience which is both 
empathic. She's moved by other human beings. She's no longer thinking of her own self, her own problems, her own thoughts. Um, but also, she says something else which I love, which is that uh, looking in this uh, evening is sort of like a marble running across a floor. You know, there's a kind of surface quality to it, but that doesn't mean it's shallow. There's a kind of freedom in looking. A f she talks about the eye floating, and that's what we looking as a kind of floating thing or a glancing thing. So she gets she gets that unbearable lightness of looking as well as those shock moments of empathy. Uh, that's quite a long answer to your question, but I think that it's that ambiguity of looking. You know, it can really move you. You can really encounter other human beings, but there's a kind of surrogate quality to it as well. Well, we're going to talk about some of that issues of encountering other individuals, issues of uh, uh, eye contact in the digital age. But before we go there, you describe looking as floating, but you've also described it in the book as uh, looking can be consolation and calibration. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Consolation in the simple sense, that old Victorian idea of consolation, which is it makes you feel better. It sort of, um, that it sort of like a balm, a healing thing, uh, something like that. And I know, I'm sure that's not for everyone. I mean, I'm more moved by music than I am by imagery. I'm more likely to cry at, at, um, I remember listening to uh, Ike and Tina Turner song, River, or not River Deep, my, my, and love like yours, don't come knock, knock, knocking every day. And I remember being an airplane banking over Manhattan and I heard that song and I saw this wonder of the world and I just started to cry. So that's the consolation bit. Calibration, but I mean social calibration. Uh, when you walk through a complex class riven uh, city like this brilliant one, for example, you feel where you are in the pecking order some way, in some way, you know, you, 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 you can look and see the hierarchies in, for example, a city. And so that's where you calibrate your social self, something like that. Well, let's just give the audience who, who may not have seen the, the book, I mean, it was released today, just an idea of what it feels like to it almost feels like running through this book. I mean, I, I, I had to read it very, very quickly to, <laughs> Thank you to, for pre reading it. <laughs> to prepare for this. And, and there's something about this book that feels like the quality of a, of a film. You're a filmmaker in your own right, and it does feel like this, this cutting between these, these mass amount of images. I think there's about 405 different images, and those are just the visual images, not the images that you conjure through the words. And I just wonder, was there a specific process that you were going through whilst writing this which was borrowed or stolen in a way from the the film work mm -hmm. that you I, did. I think something and thanks for in your very nice introduction talking about it as a road movie rather than a dinner party i read quite a lot of academic books to in order to to uh, write this one and they're good stuff but there's a stasis to them they there's something of the seminar room or the dinner party it's like a lot of people got together and sat there for a very long time and thought you know whereas i'm a very mobile person i like walking everywhere. I feel that there's a close relationship between walking and thinking. Uh, Rebecca Solnit's great book on this subject, Wanderlust. And so I felt I wanted to make a mobile, uh, write a mobile book where you feel as if you globetrot a bit, where you dart between places. I, am, I wanted to imagine what it was like to walk into, for example, Babylon up, th up the 200 meter ramp past the lions through the Ishtar gate and then have this visual overload. Uh, this is the city of, of course, the leaning of, of the Tower of Babel, for example. And in the book, I say, well, if Babel means verbal c confusion, why don't we come up with another word, Babel, which means visual confusion, which you get in a city. So I wanted to f feel as if I was sort of moving around the world and moving through history if possible. I like that kind of writing personally. Well, you don't just move through history, you move through a lifetime. And you say it multiple times throughout the book, this feels like it begins at birth and ends with death. And in actual <laughs> fact, you, you begin oh, oh, with, with this image. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, just, just for a little bit of context, Canon Gate sent me these, these wonderful, beautiful high-res <laughs> images from your book, and, and we had an email about correspondence an this morning about how we were gonna, how we were gonna run this conversation. And I think Mark says something along the lines of, well, I've got about 45 images I can just run through. And I was <laughs> like, well, maybe let's structure this. And let's structure it starting with this. This is the first, the most visceral image that we're hit with in the book. And, you talk about the emergence of looking. Why have you structured it in this this way? Why why is looking so heavily tied to a human life cycle? Um, I, 
you know, you want a rise and fall. You want an evolution. You want a that moment where a child opens their eyes. You want a first visual encounter with the world. Look at the size of the pupils in that child's eyes. And that child is too young probably to be able to focus clearly yet. It might even only be, if it's very young, it might only be seeing uh, black and white, but it clearly isn't being able to focus yet. And I loved that idea of almost starting like at the birth of time, as it were, or the birth of a child and how does it see? And then we've all, of course, been that age. And and so I wanted to start with the fuzzy image, the uh, black and white image, and then, if possible, the book could pull into focus, as it were, you know, and uh, it's just a nice storytelling technique for me, at least, you know, and then I wanted to imagine that this child... Uh, who's maybe uh, uh, in East Africa somewhere in the at the dawn of of humanity, and sort of consider what their single lifespan would be. What happens when she turns into a teenager? How does this teenager look differently at the things in their immediate world, for example? And then when they go out into the world, how do they start to look at other nations, etc.? You know, so you want to use an individual human being's life. You know, the rise and the fall as a kind of metaphor, as a kind of sine wave almost uh, for the bigger story. Well, we get given that rise and the fall throughout the book and we, we see the early stages of looking and you go from, and I'm just going to list them off because it was the, the easiest way to do it. We go from blur to depth to color to eye contact to movement stabilization to emotions to nature, desirous gauge. Your, your book covers so many how would you best summarize that that journey of looking? You know, it's an evolving sense of the visual world, a, a, a complex, a, 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 the, I was going to say, there, I don't think there's the word, an increasing complexity of the image, an increasing understanding of the thing in front of you. You know, that child is, is perplexed, uh, by the visual world and slowly, slowly accrues a sense of what the visual world is. Uh, Robert Louis Steven Stevenson, the great writer, has this phrase, a thousand coloured pictures to the eye. When that child is born, they have probably no pictures to the eye and slowly they build. It's almost like they barnacle. They're added on into the child's inner life, their inner eye. You know, And that's, that's the sense of a kind of building thing. And one of my favourite philosophers is the great uh, Scottish philosopher David Hume, who in the 1700s was writing beautifully about this, you know, our gentle absorption, our gentle of taking in the visual information from, from the outer world and then marrying it and comparing it to other things we've seen and building a sense of what the world is and how it works. Do you think there's an element in, in the way in which you're describing that, that you're borrowing from your, your film background and using that as the metaphor for looking? I just wonder what the relationship is and the reason why you stepped away from talking just specifically about film and about looking more generally. You don't just refer to, to stills from certain films, but you refer to paintings and, and attempts to, and sculptures and attempts to kind of understand the looking world. You, you, you look at color cycles, for example, and, and using those to understand more specifically about our relationship to the world through this thing called looking. Yeah, uh, to answer your first point, uh, uh, I think the f what what being a filmmaker has done for me is sensitize my looking. Those of you who are filmmakers, or even if you're taking stills, you find that when you press the shutter or when you press play, suddenly there's a slight intensity. You're like in the zone. You know, you're holding your breath. I find myself, I'm holding my breath during a shot. And so that tenderizes you in a way, you know. So that's very, that's very exciting, f you know, when you think, Oh, you really look, is this a good image? Uh, but something like this, this is Goethe here. here and um, this is before there was much real knowledge about how colour worked. But look what he's done. He's got this blue against this gold, which occurs naturally in nature. The blue and gold often compared together. Blue and gold appears con a lot in Leonardo da Vinci. Blue and gold, for those of, I know we've got some Iranian people here, the blue and gold in I I Iranian architecture and es Esfahan, for example, again and again, he got this kind of archetypal, beautiful, blue longing for gold, gold longing for blue, you know, and he got that even though some of his science is wrong he um he that i mean that is th that's a joyful image that is him yearning to understand color and just also saying look at it it's wonderful 
Well, you say that he got some of the science wrong, but it seems in this book you are identifying where, through intuition, some humans have got the science almost yeah. viscerally I know. right. I know. Isn't that incredible? You know, in, in our 20th century sense, our material sense, we thought we had worked out a lot of sort of the optical things, for example. But there was a great Arabic scholar called Hunain who was, you know, a, a medic, uh, a, a scientist, etc. And he, in Baghdad, uh, proposed something. He said that we look as follows. He says there's something called pneuma that comes from the back of your brain, goes out through your eyes into the world, encounters an object like your face, for example, is denatured by that object, comes back into my eyes, and my eyes registers the denatured natured process. So in other words, he see. it's almost like we see by sending... Um, a boomerang out and it comes back, but it's slightly different, you know. Now, that for a long time seemed preposterous because, you know, most scientists understand that the light uh, we see through from light coming into our eyes and then being bended by a lens, etc. But more recent ne neuroscience seems to suggest that when I'm looking at you, two thirds of the neural activity is back to front and only one third is front to back. In other words, I'm seeing your face comparing it to other faces that I've seen and sort of doing a, co a, a, a projection process. And so some Suddenly we arrive at the idea that looking is a bit like projection. Uh, you know, of course, as a cinema person who loves projection, you think, oh, hello, fucking Louie, that's fantastic, <laughs> you know. But um, but Hunain was at least metaphorically maybe more right than some of the more material philosophers, material thinkers in a way, you know. Newton, of course, is great on this, but I, I, th I think that that kind of poetic understanding of what looking is way back in the... 800s of the Christian era. Wow. Well, projection, that's quite a revelationary moment within the book where you start talking about this thing called projection. It's not just about looking. You stay away from the science of looking itself and you don't get into the weeds of the eye so far, but you talk about this thing called called projecting to create meaning. And let's talk a little bit more about the importance of projection. You, you almost compare it to an evolutionary process that we need to project in order to to look. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> it's just, it's, I guess, look, it's the complexity of this. You know, as I was saying, well, like when I looked into the river last night and it said, jump into me, or when Virginia Woolf's looking for her pencil, but she's really look, looking at all these homeless people, you know, that's an outwardly directed, that's a centrifugal activity, outwards, outwards, outwards. But, uh, no, sorry, that's inward. You're, t you're taking information from the outer world into yourself and having an emotional or uh, conceptual response to it. But if we now know that um, uh, looking is an outward process as well, we're projecting outwards, then that, I just love the complexity that it's binary. You know, it's, a, it's an encounter with the world which isn't only absorption, and looking isn't just a sponge. We're, m we're making stuff as we look, we're combining it with other stuff. And um, I mean, I'm not sure that I was fully aware of that before I started this book, but I'm very much so now. You know, and it fe it feels to me, having written the book, I kind of understand it better. One of my favorite uh, painters is Paul Cezanne, like he's here on my arm. And um, what did he do when he looked at Mont Saint-Victoire? He looked at it, he really looked at it, but he distrusted his looking slightly. So, for example, like a corner of a pine tree uh, is close and the Mont Saint-Victoire is very far away. So a more conventional painter would try to create visual distance between the two. Paul Cézanne didn't do that. He thought, I'm going to bring them onto the same plane and look for uh, like the kind of common contours almost, excuse me, between them. And I think there, so the, he had a skepticism about looking. I'll look, I'll love it, but I'll also um, categorize it and I'll put it in relation to other things. And I think for me now that's... Uh, my sense of what looking is it's an it's it, it's it's like you gather raw material but then you build you gather the wood but then you build the table yourself inside there's something else with regards to that and how you're sort of doing that gathering there's almost an underlying push within the book to talk about the escalation of looking so yes, all of this gathering definitely. all of this gathering yes. is leading to some thing or no thing and I just want to talk about that escalation of looking because it feels that that 
also the pace of the book, it almost feels like there's an escalation yeah. towards the end before you hit this kind of conclusion of, you know what, looking might not have changed too yes. much. Yes, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. This is, this is what we've been doing for yeah. centuries. There's a, there's a, not slowing down of looking, but there is a, there's a commonality across time when it comes to looking. So how does escalation yeah. speed play out, not just in the text, but in your mind when thinking about looking? I think most of us would say there are more visual images now than there ever were. When, you know, we feel there's a deluge, an overload. You know, where the, the screens are everywhere, the advertising's ever, everywhere. Look at photographs of Piccadilly Circus in the 1950s and look at it now. Piccadilly Cir Circus now is a kind of neon quarter. It's a kind of David Lynch movie. It's a kind of dream state almost, uh, you know, or nightmare, you could say, something like that, you know. And um, so it seems surely true that we're in a different type of looking than ever before because there's so much of it everywhere uh, all the time. Like I was in a EasyJet flight somewhere the other day and there was like an advert on the back of the seat there. Wherever I dropped my eye, I was looking for somewhere where there wasn't an advert and I couldn't see anywhere. You know, I expected there to be advertising on the back of the air staff almost because, it, you know, so that kind of visual bombardment, a kind of assault of visual and particularly commercialized visual imagery, you know, the capitalist imagery. You could say, you know, that's um, everywhere. But then the more I thought about it, I tried to think of a moment when people, was there a time when people didn't feel as overwhelmed as we feel by imagery? You know, wind the clock back to... 1960s and when people first stood on the moon and looked at the earth that must have been a huge visual shock people back then must have thought wow we've never looked like this before wind the clock further back to paris in the 1860s 70s and 80s when baudelaire had talked uh, about the, uh, the the overwhelming sense of being able to shop everywhere, see every buy things all the time. Walter Benjamin writes about this in the Arcades Project, etc. That must have felt, wow, nobody has ever looked like this before. When you walked up that ramp, ramp that I mentioned earlier uh, in Babylon and you walked through the Ishtar Gate and you looked around and here there were the Hanging Gardens. The Hanging Gardens were lined with lead and asphalt garden, like water gardens in the sky. You must have thought, wow, nobody's ever looked like this before. So I just wonder, have human beings always felt that they are in the moment of greatest looking or overwhelming looking or a kind of flooded looking? Have we always felt that? I suspect so. Is, is the need for escalation something very innately human? Are we desiring an escalation? Of yeah, we're hungry. I mean, you know, human beings are people with a real propensity to intoxication of some sense, you know, I think that, I uh, thank you, sir. So, um, Was that you, why you were in the river in <laughs> Bristol? Yes, 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 exactly <laughs> that. Um, and uh, you, like, we, we, we are desirous of things, you know, and visual pleasure is such a great pleasure uh, that, you know, why would you stop? Why would you put a, a break on it? Why, why don't you just have more and more visual pleasure? I'm, I'm sure we're going to get onto some of that, that stuff, you know, but I think it's hard to put a break on something that's enjoyable or at least compulsive. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to point at a time in history and people said, enough already, I don't want to do any more looking. You know, there are, of course, in mystics and um, people in religious areas, etc., or people decide at some point I'm going to go and live on a Scottish island or something. I don't want to do deal with this assault anymore, but it's, it's a, I think it's always been there. Well, why does looking itself get all the attention? I just wonder, is it because it's a high bandwidth medium? Is there something... Uh, oh, that's a good idea. Because we have high visual cultures, medium. we have visual culture courses, but we don't acknowledge the other five Aristotelian senses in the study as much as we perhaps should. Or if there's just five, there might be a lot more. We're bringing in other senses into, into the realm when we talk about our relationship technology, whether it's our ability to feel balance and uh, yeah. the, the shape of the body. I just wonder why... Why looking is the paragon of the senses? Is it because it's a high bandwidth medium or is there something more to looking that makes it so important to us as human beings? I think it's complicated because when you think of the, the muses, for example, there's no muse in the visual arts. There was no muse for the visual arts, for all the other arts there were. You know? So you could say in some way looking was déclassé. 
you know, low grade, everybody could do it if they were lucky enough to have sight, you know, so why even think about it? It's just there. It's like air, you know, um, but um, nowadays there's a lot of talk about looking for the reasons we've already said that because of the of imagery being everywhere. I would also say that looking more than some of the other senses has been fought over by religious people. You know, we t we you know there, in many cultures there's the idea of the evil eye. The eye is something you know that first of all, an eye is a scary thing. If you go to try and poke somebody's eye, it's like oh, it, it, it's most vulnerable. You know, it's like a, a glassy thing that's very easy to stick a, a a needle in an eye. That how horrible that would be. So there's something about looking that has been almost um, demonized, I would say, which uh, think of, of course, most recently the Taliban and how they hate the idea of looking, think further back of um, uh, of John Knox in Scotland, for example, you know, um, that idea that th that the word, that, that, that words are more ethical, more valuable, more civilized, more uh, better at con at at communicating information or ideas more closer to a moral considered worldview and looking as wild looking as baroque looking as untamed looking as dionysian looking as the devil looking as sex looking as violence etc and there's some truth in all that there really is as we know you know and um so i think that's why looking excites and repulses people that's why it's more contested that's why people try to censor looking more than other things i think you know um like if, if we're we have to admit that people slow down on on motorways when there are road traffic accidents for example uh, we have to admit that um like until uh, recent centuries people flocked to see hangings and decapitations you know we have to admit that in Paris in the 1800s, one of the biggest entertainments was going to the Paris morgue to see dead bodies kept kept fresh by cold water dripping on them. You know, there's been this kind of um, a kind of desirous sort of seedy almost uh, feeling, uh, really feeling about looking, which lots of people, especially religious people, have tried to control. And I think what's happened is ethically we've reworked some of these things. We as societies have changed our opinions, I think updated our opinions. We no longer think it's right to do what the Victorians did, which is flock to see uh, John Merrick, the the elephant man, for example. You know, I, but, somebody but who's... Have we? But well, have we? You so know, a you civilized look society... Look at these Facebook live streams of, of young children walking in front of trains or committing suicide or there being something... Have you watched that stuff? I... You you see the uh, the pixelized version yes. of, and if you're of a certain state of mind, you do go looking for it on Reddit, and it will be it will be very very quickly desensitized. People do have this aversion of posting that sort of stuff. You're seeing the beheaded kids from Syria and the blooded kids from Syria on your Facebook feed, and either you can make the decision to block it, or you you do have a moment of pause, which of course the Facebook algorithms register as. Attention, spike in attention. Mm -hmm. You're what, looking at these very grotesque images, and they're, they're grotesque, but also they're, they're, there's something aesthetically beautiful and problematic about the blood splurting in a Franco B mm -hmm. performance art sort of way, a performance artist who uses blood in his work to create these very beautiful but very grotesque images. Do you think there's something there? It's just it's not. We don't gather in the square. We gather online I to look at those sorts of uh, those sorts of weird and wondrous problematic images of, of this displayed is, bodies? Yeah, I mean, this is a very complicated subject because I think that we're talking about three different, three things happening at once. One, the first is, is life, is society, is is the world around us getting more violent? Uh, the answer is probably no. Probably fewer people are dying in wars than they were a century ago or two centuries ago or three centuries ago. So if maybe there's a slight drop in the total number, total amount of violence in the world. The second question is about technology. Have we more technologies to see that stuff? The answer is a profoundly fucking yes. There's, we can see whatever you want to see, you know. So life's maybe getting a little bit less violent. Technology's getting massively more able to deliver us what our id requires, what our worst instinct 
think requires. But the third thing, and this is perhaps the most interesting thing, is our ethical response to that material. I think as society overall, and of course there are loads of exceptions, but overall we think that there are some things that are unacceptable now, that there w we would generally, mo well, of course when I say we, I mean certain societies and uh, t today would be outraged if there was a public hanging or if there was public execution. Uh, that's no longer socially acceptable. And that's us as human human beings, individuals, families, groups, etc., saying, coming, trying to come to some consensus about what we think is fair, how, who, who will be harmed, what relatives of the dead people will be harmed or hurt if this if these images are spread widely mm -hmm. but you mentioned crucially syria and it's important i haven't watched any of that stuff at all the, the you know any of the stuff that's put on by isis etc but i did of course force myself to look at that tragic photograph of the little uh, boy alan kurdi i think he was called lying on the beach and i have looked at other stuff and i think we have to do that stuff you know i i think i have to see the imagery of some of somalia i think i have to see the imagery of aleppo even though i don't want to or maybe part of me does want to you know but i think that as a citizen i should see it and I think that's, therefore, what's happening. You know, uh, the world's getting perhaps a little less violent. Technology's going, woof, and then, but we are having this moral debate about what we should see in order to try and to understand these two things. Or is it, is it about the deliverance of it, the fact that it just appears on that feed or it comes with consent warnings or, or it just appears? It's going it, to it's go, it's be there somehow. I uh -huh. think it's extremely hard to control that stuff now. You know, there, we're in a kind of free age, a kind of libertarian age, where that kind of imagery is going to be available somewhere. So previously, of course, things were unavailable. I, I talk in the book about the era of want to see, when you want to see something long before you can see something. You know, when I was growing up as you were a kid, you wanted to see sexual imagery, but you sort of couldn't, you know, because it was hardly available. Now it's hard, it's opposite, it's hard to so avoid, avoid not see yeah. it, you know. And um, so we've moved from a period of want see to can see. Um, uh, so then we have to, we have more choices to make, we have to engage our control mechanisms more or at least reflect more on what what actually might damage us if we see it, I think. Or um, like I was talking earlier today about, I saw the film The Exorcist when I think I was 14 far too young. I had nightmares for years and years. I really regret having seen it that young. I'm glad I've seen it now. You know, it's just, a, I think it said, in the era of plenitude, when everything's available, including the most disturbing visual material imaginable, then we have to work out new ways of, and it's often our, our personal choice if we're grown ups. what will we encounter and why should we do so? Well, let's, let's go through this just a slightly bit more and then we can come out and talk about some more egalitarian things about looking, but how can looking exploit or control or, or, or demean and how can we become more aware of when our looking is being controlled? Loads of ways. Surveillance, for example. There are uh -huh. roughly 100 million surveillance cameras in the world. Um, I don't know how many there are on this street alone. There are w roughly one surveillance camera for every 10 uh, North American or uh, North uh, Americans, for example, um, that's a problem. And our cities become like camera mounts. You know, there are things. The cities are things on which to mount eyes on the sky uh, to to uh, watch what we do. That's very very bad. I think another very bad thing that's happened is that the more we see images of ourselves, the more we might ha start to worry about how we look and are we skinny enough and how do, how do we fit into, you know, the sort of idealized m modes of human body, etc. I think that's really da dangerous and that's really damaging and we've seen that along for a, for a long time now uh, in the effect that's had on women and I think increasingly it's happening, it's having an effect on men as well, increased uh, incidence of eating disorder, etc. So I think that's a really, really damaging aspect of imagery, particularly advertising imagery and, and over over concern of how we look. So there are two things that come to mind that I think are, are um, damaging about this new era of what I, in the book I call the split eyeball, the kind of explosion of imagery. We also talk about not just the areas where looking can control, but it can also enhance our lives. You're very careful in the book to to not make any 
clear value judgments on how and why yeah. we look. It's mostly and good. Looking mostly, is mostly yeah. good. And the technology is mostly good. Uh -huh. I can't tell you how many grandparents have said, you know, their grandchildren are living on the other side of the world and they can see them once a week on Skype. And that is fantastic you know that you know there of course it's easy to be nostalgic about what you could call the loss of distance there's no such thing as distance anymore like everything you know you can you, you can skype or use other mechanisms but that is huge social good when my uncle El um, emigrated to australia in 1956 my grandmother didn't see him for uh, 30 years a few photographs came Imagine if he had gone there now, you know, you could see, you know, it, it, the, the travel rent fam, rented families asunder. It doesn't do so. That's a huge social good. I think um, there are there, it, it's a huge good that we can, for example, see the Northern Lights. It used to be like hundreds of years ago, people might have heard of the Aurora Borealis, but you would not have seen it. Now there's a live feed and you can watch it, you know. There's a, you know, if you want to, there are badger watches and whale watching um, uh, websites where you can watch stuff live. This is all, I mean, it's, you could sort of say, of course, well, it was only a representation. It's not like being there, you know. But I think, screw that. At least we're seeing it in some sense, you know. That we're halfway to paradise. And I think that, I, I think a lot of the new technologies are halfway to paradise. I think it's mostly great stuff, you know. And, um, and th there, there's some of the kind of visual longing. We, we were in a kind of visual desert for a long time, you know. There was a kind of forced separation when people migrated, emigration, I think, you know. I've, I've done a wee bit of volunteering in some of the refugee camps in, in Calais and um, Greek Macedonian border, and people are talking to their families back home uh, and looking at them on their mobile phones. It's... So moving. There's a photo in this book. I'm sure you saw it. Um, it's a it's an amazing photograph of the Ber Berlin Wall being built. You know that one, yeah. And it was built very rapidly, as you know. And there's a picture of a family. Oh, it's so moving. Family holding their little babies up just above the wall because maybe the granny and granddad were on the other side of the wall. And this is the last glimpse. One more brick, and they won't see their grandchildren for they don't know how long, maybe ever. And it was. Uh, you know, so that, you know, Skype removed all that iniquity, all that massive loss, all that devastation. Uh, so, you know, you can see how positive I feel about that stuff. <laughs> I probably overstated it a little bit, but uh, there you go. Well, you mentioned and then people will see this, will they? They're, they're not saying it now, but uh, you're going to edit this to make us seem articulate, I hope. Oh, I see. Thank you. All right. Uh, so there'll be about five, ten minutes. Um, so, <laughs> so you, you mentioned you could play at that game. <laughs> you, uh, I'm joking. I'm you up. So you talked about this thing called the the, the, the split eyeball. You yep. mentioned that very, very quickly, and it comes from this this metaphor, this sliced eyeball that you use in reference to a 1929 film, and I think I have the image. I'm going to bring it up in a second. So and you use that as a metaphor for looking in the 21st century. It, it, it gets to about three quarters through the book, and then we use this metaphor to basically understand how we engage with digital technology going yeah. forward. I just wonder if you could explain with a little more detail that that split sliced yeah. eyeball metaphor. Yeah, it's a Bunuel image and, uh, you know, the, uh, oh, there it is, voila, look at that. Um, this particular frame actually has, um, I met the Bunuel estate and they, they they said, oh, would you like a frame that is very nerdy? But this particular frame has never seen, been seen before. How nerdy is that? Anyway, uh, on, on. Uh, but that idea, I thought I thought it was a lovely metaphor. You know, in the next moment, the the um, razor cuts her eye and we cut to a close-up of a cow's eye being split and then the liquid spurts out. And I thought that was, first of all, a good image for like in this kind of volcanic eruption of, of, of imagery in the in the late 19th, 20th, 20th, and into the 20th and 21st century. But um, not only the amount, not only the spurt, not only the eruption, but also this is a surreal image. There's something scary about it. And I think looking has become more surreal in recent uh, decades than it has been previously. You know, Skype is a surreal thing. You know, Skype is impossible in some ways. Skype is a kind of something that Salvador Dali might have, have imagined, I think, you know, so it captures the 
um, there's this word in German. I don't speak German, so I will not attempt to pronounce it, but there's a word. Are there any German speakers here? Uh, uh, good. I'm so pleased. <laughs> um, uh, there's this word that means reality losing its real realness. And uh, why don't I have a go? In Verklichung, something like that. Um, reality losing its realness. And this is some kind of image of reality losing its realness. Instead of the real world, we have representations of the real world in front of our eyes. Uh, yeah. And so when I went walking down the street today, it used to be, I was talking to Anna, who I've been with today, it used to be when I walked around London, I walked around London, I knew my way, I would frequently walk from Liverpool Street to White City and just know how to get there. And now I've forgotten that stuff because I just look at my phone and all I see is an arrow and I walk wherever the arrow tells me to walk, you know, and reality has lost its realness. I'm not actually looking at the real street. Um, I'm looking at, and yeah, so I think that that reality losing its realness is one of the downsides of this kind of surrealism of imagery in the modern world. Well, do do you think we're we're now carrying Leicester or Piccadilly Circus in our pockets to talk a little bit about smartphone culture and this this shiny the tyranny of this shiny glowing rectangle which takes up so much of our looking? I mean, it do you think? believe that it takes from us or do you believe that it's actually giving us an ability to frame new forms of looking we've seen the apple ads all over london this is taken with the iphone 6 this photo uh -huh. taken with the iphone 7 this this purported ability to engage with new forms of looking through these devices but also it's taking something as well is it not um, I'm slightly less pessimistic about it than that. You know, I just think it's something that sometimes gets in the way. You know, I got a new phone the other day and it, it's 19 megapixels. And he said, but the next one, if you only pay another £10 a month, it'll be 23 megapixels. You know, and you need to go in a really, 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 really big screen even to notice the difference, you know. So there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of process, there's a lot of kind of talk, which sort of slightly gets in the way. We were all m moved and fascinated by the light, that yellow light a few days ago, wasn't it? that sort of Jeez. like okay. like, uh, like Blade Runner light, you know, when London looked like Blade Runner. I love your like, thoughts on that, your specific thoughts. Were, yeah. were you well, I was, I was in Edinburgh oh. at the t at time, but it was yellow, <laughs> it was <laughs> so yellow you know, there as well. It was, yeah, like the, yeah, yeah, so. it was uh, yellow there. It wasn't not as much of the Sahara got to Edinburgh as it did to London, but it was fascinating, you know, it was that kind of, it, it's that thing that light, the poetics of light, you know, light is almost inherently poetic. And it was, like it was, it was, um, it was certainly like a sci-fi thing, wasn't it? We were all sort of somehow moved. It was almost like there was a, some kind of eclipse going on. We probably knew that, you know, there was pollution in there. And they said that there was some smoke from the fires in Portugal that day as well that had got this way. But whatever it was, it made us feel, of course, we all got our mobile phones out and tried to photograph it. But certainly the magic, the mystery, the numinous quality, the sublime quality was not in the mobile phone. The mobile phone was just some recording mechanism. You know, we were all, you know, that film Close Encounters the third time where you go and you stare up at the sky we were all dead, whoa, what is this? We were all Richard Dreyfus. Uh, and so that shows that, you know, whatever the mobile phone does, whatever its ma magnetic attraction, whatever it says, look at me, don't look at the world, look at the world, just look at me, I'm far more interesting than the world. Actually, the world is far more interesting than the mobile phone. And But, but there, was a, there was a layering to that experience. I don't, I don't want to get caught specifically on this, this yes. example, but there was a layering to that experience whereby people were taking these photographs and then posting them on social media going, oh, look, it's an Instagram filter on London. Yeah. There, there was this, <laughs> yeah. this stealing yeah, and, you know. and borrowing from, from the virtual know. and bringing it into the actual. I mean, that is a bit irritating, but it's just a bit irritating. It's <laughs> not more than that. All right. You know, we, I don't think we should get much more worked up about that. It is, it's just slightly... I remember when I... <laughs> this is... I remember when... <laughs> <laughs> when I was at university, I was walking through a pine forest and my friend, so not on, not most of you will not be old enough to know this reference, but my friend said, and we were, we're in mind, we're walking through a pine forest and said, I smell Ajax. <laughs> now, Aj Ajax is a clean, cleaning fluid that uses pine oil to give it a bit of a smell and he had got a, the cart before the horse. He, he, he had forgotten like the, the, like the original offline world uh, it led to the Ajax and still so if we have our mobile phone and say look it looks like a, a, a filter that's just you know 
That's sort of slightly silly. And it, the slight danger is then we won't be mo as moved as we should be by these, like, for example, light phenomena, by the aurora borealis, by an unusual weather formation, etc. cetera. Uh, there's danger of that. But, you know, we have to think globally here, you know, and I think other languages um, are particularly brilliant at this. I remember being in West Bengal and in Calcutta, and we were talking about the word for dusk. And I said the word for dusk in English is dusk. Four letters, pretty simple. Boom, dusk. The um, Are there any Bengali speakers in here? Oh, good. I hope not. I'm so pleased <laughs> um, because I'll mangle this one as well. Um, and the word for dusk in Bengali is a big, long composite word, and it means the look of the light when the cows kick dust into the air as the sun sets. <laughs> That's a poem in itself. That's a haiku. That's a one-word poem. That's a one-sentence poem, you know. And so that ineff ineffable poetry of light will, you know, if we if we turn into mobile phones, you know, in some future, you know, the ineffable poetry of light will still be there. Well, has, has the poetry of light been reduced to light as a as a medium for the transmission of information? I know. Isn't that incredible? Like visual information is transmitted on visual information, isn't that? Or on light? Light is transmitted on light. That's like, that's a head fuck. <laughs> so, so, but, yeah. but, Fiber but, optics. I mean, my God, how, I, I, I've tried to think of that loads of times. But, but when light purely becomes a, a medium to trans or transmit information, that's where we get close to what you do allude to in the book, which is the idea of, well, then what's the importance of the eyes? Why can't we just plug this stuff straight in? Why do we have to go through this sensory medium? What is so important and so special about the human eye? Why should we give that elevation? Why can't we just well, do you, do you want my honest answer to that? Yeah, I don't care. If eyes are superseded <laughs> and I can <laughs> still get the same hit, if I can still be as moved by the dust kicked up by the cows at dawn in Calcutta. I don't care how I get it. I don't care if there's a sensor there or if these like these orbs, these binocular orbs that have been roughly the same for 50 or 100,000 years, I don't care if they somehow are superseded uh, um, as long as I get it. As long as that, there's that encounter, that outwardly directed encounter, that existential thing, that sense of the universe, of, of nature. Um, Really, it doesn't matter to me. I, I, I want to talk about Skype just for a little bit, simply because you put so much onus on eye contact. And it feels like this day and age, these phones are making it harder and harder for us to engage with each other, to have mm -hmm. a uh, art of conversation, to be mm -hmm. able to hold eye contact with another mm -hmm. individual. There's mm -hmm. arguments to be said with regards to uh, young children's relationship with their phones is making them borderline autistic. And also Skype as a technology doesn't allow for eye contact because of the place. I know. The camera. I mean, really, I mean, and really, the, is it beyond us to put a camera right in the middle of the screen? Surely to goodness. Well, I want. Why really? <laughs> really? Why has that not happened? That. You know, look how much yeah. you and I are looking at each other. Uh -huh. We've looked at each other a lot in this discussion. You know, if it was a phone call, it would be a completely different field, you know, I think, you know. And, uh, um, but honest to God, why is the camera not in the middle of the screen? Why, when you're Skyping to somebody, are you looking, looking either at, at their chin or at their forehead? That, uh -huh. I mean, that is primitive. Really? I mean... But do you think that... that that's like, hello, the, chin. Do, do you think that's the exemplary... Uh, example of how we've misunderstood looking in the digital age you know the important thing is is the eye contact when it comes to conversing human to human to actually read those non those non uh, auditory or mm -hmm. non uh, non auditory signals those visual signaling um, to be able to read someone to actually smell someone to be in the same uh, biological environment as someone do you think there has been a stripping down and the ability to not be able to keep eye contact with someone via Skype is the perfect exemplar, exemplar of that issue inside of digital technology. Yes, I sort of do. You know, did you see that um, Marina Abramovich? There was a documentary. I didn't see the real life thing the where she sat and the, where she looked at people. And I was in the building because Rosalyn was in, but I didn't sit in the chair. But yeah, but I was in the in in MoMA in New York that day that when she did that. But um, that was incredible. That what she did, you know, you're sitting in this 
to choose New York, a city where eye contact doesn't happen a lot. If you're sitting in the subway, you know, people are reading and so you're not just eyeballing somebody, you know. And, and she decided to do the most shocking thing. You know, she could have sat there naked, you know, she could have done something perhaps more sexual, but just to look at other human beings for as long as they wanted to look at her. No matter, some of you, was anybody actually there in MoMA for that? No. But many of you will have seen the documentary about it called The Artist is Present, and people cry, and I cried when I watched it. Many of you have seen the documentary. A few, and isn't it incredibly moving? Like just the idea that another human being will just look into your eyes for as long as you want, you know. And 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 it it can be, of course, it can be aggressive, you know. If you come from a place in the world where there's been violence, as as I do, you learn about those looks, and you will learn when not to hold the stare of somebody, you know, because then they'll take that as an offence or a a kind of come on to fight, you know. But she did it something you know, almost mythically different, I think. Um, and so you're really right to talk about this thing. And, you know, obviously you're, you, it's interesting because you're very much about future technologies and yet we're talking about some timeless things here, aren't we? You know, we're talking about the sort of the, the, the first order questions about these kind of human properties, the encounter with nature, encounter with another human being's stare, etc. cetera. And um, I think she, that artwork, whatever you think of her work, I think that artwork was, I think, one of the most significant artworks uh, in the digital age. I think the fact that she said, okay, I'll bring this, I'll pair this right back to what people were doing on the savannah in the earliest days of humanity. There's something so wonderful about like Marina Abramovich's work where she demands the ability to be present, to, to be in a place in time. And the argument is that maybe digital technology, maybe screens have taken that away from us. But the thing that's going to fix that is the thing that's sitting at the back of the room. It's going to be virtual Reality. Virtual reality is going to give us place illusion and plausibility illusion. I know. It's going to put us back in place into the world to allow us it. to be present again. Where do you stand? Because you you glaze and you touch and then you you talk about AR and you you step away from from VR perhaps because right now we're so underdeveloped when we think about mm -hmm. VR. It's still 360 video. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not really these whole new worlds that we've built that we can explore. I just wonder, where do you stand I think with VR, you know, VR and what it does to looking? Lots of people are saying that VR, virtual reality, is a new art form. It doesn't feel, it feels like the most brilliant extension of a rather fame art, a famous art form called cinema. Uh, in Venice this year at the, at the film festival, I saw a 55-minute VR film. Some people say that VR should only be 5 or 10 minutes or maybe 15 minutes anymore and you can't cope. What did they say about the birth of cinema when cinema first came along? Nobody can watch more than 5 or 10 or 15 minutes and you can't cope. Déjà vu. Um, uh, déjà entendu. Uh, but um, v uh, uh, this film that I was watching was by a great uh, filmmaker, Simon Liang, and it's set in a room and not much happens. And at one point, uh, in, through the VR helmet, I saw a mosquito flying at me and I watched it fly around. And then I thought, oh, no, I haven't put on my mosquito, uh, my repellent. And then I thought, I'm not there. I don't need mosquito repellent. How fantastic, you know, if if one of the what if one of the drives of cinema was towards more and more illusionism, I think VR has taken it one step further. I think its creative possibilities are immense. That film that that, that my lovely friends have made here, you know, there's a cut in there to a cathedral, and it's like, wow, you know, it's like. Cut, edit, editing in VR, a cut in VR is more profound, I think, than a cut in flat, what, what I'm now going to call flat cinema. I can't believe uh. I'm even using this term, flat cinema. Um, it's so over. <laughs> it's not, obviously. But, you know, um, that, that kind of cut, cut there. And also the other thing, of course, in VR, there's more of a phantom quality to it. You know, depending on how high the camera is, you really feel that you're floating because you can look underneath yourself as well. And so there's more of a kind of ghost-like floating world quality to VR, which I find very exciting. Those those cuts, don't you think to a degree they're disjointing? No, so we, see, we've seen no, that, we've seen no, because I, I, I no, 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 I don't, no, I don't. Right. That's that's what people said when you know. Well, Chris Milk stuff. You, you suddenly you're in this beautiful vista, then suddenly you're on the back of a helicopter, and you're like, Jesus Christ! But, like, how did I end but, up here? Look, that's that's a cut. <laughs> that's all it is. 
You know, people said that about, people said that in early cinema, you cannot cut from a wide shot to a close-up because people will feel shocked. Like, they're suddenly in a big space and then they're a small space. When when widescreen came along and uh, popu more popularized in the 1950s because it was so wide, they didn't shoot close-ups anymore because they thought that people, it would be too visually disturbing. It wasn't. And when you look at all those old 50s movies now, they all look, you know, it's all full body. It looks like theater. You know, we, we are remarkably adaptive in our way of engaging with visual shocks and visual changes. And I don't, I know, uh, sorry, and, and obviously uh, not mocking your, um, your, your comment there, but I certainly don't feel, um, dis too, I don't feel disturbed at all by a, a cut in VR. Do you feel disturbed about this image, though? <laughs> um, so no. from, VR no. to, from VR to <laughs> AR, the, the, the fact that we have to hold these devices up to then re-engage with our everyday world, the fact that we can create this new form of fake looking, this layered looking onto the everyday... I just, can just, you people at the back see what it is? It's, the, it's Pokemon. Pokemon Go. <laughs> po Pokemon Go. You know, I... Am, you know, I I'm sure you would not be surprised that I'm not like the world's greatest uh, lover of Pokemon Go. However, take that silly little yellow thing off and put something else here. Like, say this room, for example. I don't know the history of this room. Who was in this room? Was Oscar Wilde in this room? Was Francis Bacon in this room? If I could have a phone that I could hold up and it could tell me everything that happened in this room... How great that would be. That's augmented reality. You don't need to carry guidebooks and think what happened here. You know, In some near future, we will be able to hear all the cultural or scientific or historical or political events that happened in this room simply by holding our phone up. That's... You know, that is like a dream come true. You know, for a lot of, of, of human culture, we've been trying to you know learn about history and what happened in certain places soon it'll be a sort of pokemon go uh model of how we can learn there's a guy standing at the back with a vr headset called bren greenaway who's thinking that's a great idea for virtual futures. oh good can i get 10 so we'll, percent, please ben <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna port you and overlay all the speakers that we've had in this wonderful room for the future of this but, event, but, but isn't that a serious idea? You know, that's like, a wonderful you know, idea in terms I mean, of being able so to layer obvious, this. Isn't it? You know, all the layers, and then if you if you're not interested in literature or painting and whatever you're interested in, you know, if you're into political history, you can like your phone can tell you everything that happened of in political history in the space where you are. Surely that's coming. I mean, really, Pro providing they're not watching that while also watching the live event. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's you know, I, I would again, I agree with you. I would say that's a second order problem. Yeah, we have to get our shit together so we're not. We actually have to look at the real world and well, then use our phone to augment. Literally, it's in the the clues in the title, augmented reality. Well, you to know? come full circle back to the example that you gave right at the beginning of this conversation about homeless individuals, I've seen the evangelists of this sort of technology argue this is going to be incredible because we'll be able to put on the goggles and walk down the street and re-engineer our reality so that we'll never see homeless people. Oh, yes. Screen, screen people out. This will hide more yeah. than it reveals. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue of power and money. People with power and money can screen people out anyway because you ride in a limousine with tinted glass or you live in a gated community. and all. So we, people do that anyway. But yes, I'm sure technology will allow people who, who are disturbed by those less fortunate than themselves. I'm sure technology will allow them to not be disturbed. So on that note, I want to open this up to our incredible audience. And um, if someone from VF can run a mic for me, if, if Ben, you're at the back, or someone who's, who's friendly to our cause, thank you. Um, so are there any burning questions? <laughs> thank you. Uh, just here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, so throughout you are speaking about uh, the act of looking as being mainly physical, as I can understand it. And I'm quite interested in thinking about looking um, maybe as being also a social and, and maybe even political uh, act 
So, so you're saying that looking is just something that is, is there. So if you are present and there's an object, you can see it almost as if it is unmediated. Um, but I'm thinking about, so for example, uh, Rancière, the philosopher of English. Oh, yes, yeah, my good. And I didn't expect Rancière to be mentioned tonight. On you go. I, I've struggled with him, but I'll have a go. Yeah, I? but he talks about um, a community of sense or a census communis, how uh, through our pol political ideology, we are sort of, um, that comes to affect what we see and what we don't see in a way. So, so while there's, I suppose a physical focusing in. There is also a social focusing in. We are sort of taught what to see and, and not to see. So uh, while we might be present, there are there are things that we we tend to overlook. There are people that are invisible to us. Yeah. And I just think it's interesting to sort of bring back into this relation between contrasting um, the difference between seeing in real life and seeing through technology. That maybe the difference isn't actually that great, that what we see is already manipulated, even though we are there physically present, we are already affected by a history uh, <coughs> and so on. Yeah, I, I think there's some truth in that. I feel ambiguous about that in some way. You know, we are definitely, you know, uh, we see what we understand or what our, our identity allows us to see. You know, for instance, I would say as well, you know, we talk about the male gaze, for example, how men look at women or how certain types of women become invisible to men. I would say also there's the white gaze, that there's certain types of non-white people become invisible to white people. So I agree that we, you know, it's not an empirical thing. We are blind to things that are in right in front of us, you know, and I've heard other people say it's a slightly, you know, postmodern argument, you know, that the seeing on a screen is maybe not all that different from seeing in real life, which is the point that you mentioned. I sort of go with that to a certain extent, but um, I overall, I take a slightly more optimistic and perhaps more primitive view, which is that we can, this, we still have the ability to be shocked, no matter how much we're conditioned to see what we are, we're brought up to see. For example, my background is very working class, and so I am more, I I am more um, visually alert to working class life than to maybe posher life in some way. I don't read it as as well. However, I think the thing about looking, which I've been trying to say, and you're perhaps right to pick me up on this, is that I think that there's something as well about looking that exposes you beyond your own conditioning, your own experience. Like I've been to, like I went to Sarajevo during the siege. I made a film in, in Iraq uh, and nothing quite prepared me for that. I was constantly alert. I can remember those images more clearly than things that happened a few days ago. It's because I was doing a more heightened kind of seeing. People talk about, you know, the fight or flight mechanism when you're extra alert, when you are, your senses are heightened. And I think sometimes that happens. And so we do, I would say, sorry to be like almost qualitative about this, but there are times when we do better looking, sometimes when we're scared, for example, or sometimes when we're in an unusual environment. So I don't quite take the Ranciere uh, opinion. <laughs> Sorry, that, that I think he actually does talk about that. How, um, well, he talks about the aesthetic events as, as sort of being a rupture of that. Rupture, that's the word. Yeah, there is, you know, your, your barriers can be bash broken down by something so arresting. They really can, I think. And I think that's what's hopeful about this sense of looking and other senses as well, of course. I remember, I remember when my dad, to, just to jump from looking to hearing, I remember I got a phone call one day and um, it was my mom, but she couldn't speak. Something awful had happened. It turned out that my dad had died right in front of her. But what she did instead is get the telephone and bang it against the wall, bang, bang. So she couldn't speak, but she wanted to make a noise. And I'll never forget that noise as long as I live. Uh, and because it was like the most, her most brilliant way of, of saying like 
um, some kind of emergency. And that ruptures everything. That ruptured my hearing in a way. I'll remember that. And I think you could say the same for visuals. There was another question just in. Hi. Um, Hi. I feel like my question fits in so well here. Um, <laughs> really I it went, does or it doesn't? It does. Oh, perfect. This, yeah, yeah. Nice one. <laughs> um, I went to see the filmmaker Lucas Martel speak on the weekend. Oh, God, I haven't seen her new film yet. It's I hear so it's good. brilliant. It. Yeah, Zama, yeah. is that what it's called? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's really, I thought it was great. I would have swooned if I had met her. I think she's one of the greats. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. Well, she, I was going to say, so she talked a lot about, um, she uses sound in this really fascinating way where she kind of, uh, so she says that she uses it to, um, it's kind of, she says it's immersive in a way in the cinema that visuals aren't, in that you can shut your eyes, but you can never shut your ears. And so she uses it on this kind of narrative plane to kind of have this whole subplot of the things that people won't see or won't say. Um, and she kind of was talking about how this can be really subversive in terms of like, just reordering she said in the cinema you have this chance to really immerse people and that uh which i found kind of strange because obviously people watch films on their phones now anyway but um, i mean i mean imagine watching a film on your phone is that unbelievable i mean like what i don't know really people, yeah, I, think <laughs> I know it happens i know it happens you know but i'm with david lynch i just think that's fucking ridiculous <laughs> anyway sorry to interrupt um yeah, so she just was talking about this kind of subversive potential of using sound in cinema um, and reordering perception and also maybe our perception of our bodies. And you talked about how in VR you're almost kind of floating. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I mean, maybe what do you think of this kind of subversive potential of not having looking as being the centre of things. Yes, yeah. I mean, Lucretia Martel's being slightly modest because she made you like, think of her film The Headless Woman, you know, her, she made, she's made some of the best images, I think. Yeah, I and, just saw that yesterday. Oh, did you? Isn't it great? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. really great. So, um, yeah, definitely the, sort of, in cinema, if we're talking about cinema, the relationship between sound and picture, Jean-Luc Godard had a lovely saying. He said that darkness, i.e. a black screen, is out of frame by other means. I love that, i.e. you can't, there's no light. So absolutely, sound is extremely evocative in cinema. But what I would say is there's a kind of desirous relationship between the soundtrack and the image track. The image track wants to be, almost have the quality of, of sound or music. And the soundtrack almost wants to have something concrete, music concrète, you know, accusmètre, all these ideas, you know. So I think that they... Um, She's right, there's no doubting the evocative power of sound, particularly in cinema. And I notice that I talk about looking, Some I know you're not doing this, but people often say, but what about sound or what about music or what about listening? Of course, you know, of course, but that's been talked about quite a lot, you know, and I think that for me, that's why I want to talk about the image track. And she, But she's um, right, of course, cinema started silent, as we know. And, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, if you, I want to um, I once listened to David Lynch's film Blue Velvet without the image track, and it was incredible. Why? Yeah. Question. I just want to go back to your Hi. talk about advertisements. Oh, yes. The way we're being bombarded Sorry, I by them. <laughs> yes. And digital signage now, you know, the way when you look at it, yeah. we should be thinking about what's looking back at us, because inside some digital signage, you know, it's sometimes yes. there's cameras scanning you, getting your facial recognition image. So it's almost like by looking, you're selling data. It's a commodification. And actually, this happened in Dublin near the Harp Bar. Oh, yes. One of these digital signs. Great, great yeah, bar, the Harp got, Bar. Uh, yeah, very classy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> very but, upmarket. Uh, it got damaged, and people were horrified to find these cameras underneath, and like, it drew a lot of attention. But in, in a way, you know, thinking of reasons not to look is as important in the 21st century uh, because you're looking is supplying data. Yeah. I mean, that's horrible, obviously. You know, who yeah. could disagree with that? You know, that's dystopic, of course. Um, uh, yeah. And that's that's one of the when we started talking about some of the bad bits of looking and advertising and the, the visual overload and the assault. And that's definitely one of them. And, you know, f certain films like my, that film Minority Report slightly predicted that, you know, as you walk along the advert, the advert will turn into something that you're more likely to to want to acquire. You know, and there's something horrible in that. Obviously, I detest that. You know, I don't want to be read by, of all things, an advert. You know, that's terrible. So, yeah, totally agree. 
but it doesn't mean, of course, I'm sure you agree, it doesn't mean that some, there's in something inherently bad in looking. It's just it being used in, 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 in an extremely iniquitous way. Well, when it comes to mass observation, which is underlying that question, is it less of a case of who is looking in the digital age and what is looking? So we've seen the, is it, it's called a, a capped chicka, and I may have pronounced that wrong, and that's not a German word, and it's, it stands for completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. It's that little thing you get where you have to say, you know, the little, the little image you get to say that you're oh, not a yes. human, you oh, see yeah. the front door yes, of someone's yes. thing, and it goes, yes. oh, Click can the you identify that, yeah, yeah. the, the yeah. animals, or yeah. can you identify the numbers, or yeah. tell me what the number is? Do you think we're training our machines to look? Yes, probably. Yeah, I'm sure. And I'm sure there'll be, it, it's probably, it's very easy to imagine a near future where there, um, where a, a machine could somehow look at the light effects over London, the Blade, Blade Runner effect, and be in some sense, not only reactive, because for a long time cameras have had auto exposure, but in some more profound sense, be changed by the, what we called earlier, the poetics of light. It's certainly possible to imagine the idea of poetics being programmable, definitely, or a response to poetics being pro programmable. I'm not bright enough to work out the implications of that, but it's certainly imaginable, I think, you know. Uh, and But maybe we should just be flattered by that because if, if a machine is, is going to uh, almost copy or be, you know, um, to... to want to feel that what we feel when we see the dust kicked up by the cows at dusk to, to go back to that, then who wouldn't want that? That makes you feel incredibly alive. The very first thing I said to you is that looking makes me feel alive. Why wouldn't a machine want to feel alive? I, I, I was going to avoid it today, but almost it reminds me of Blade Runner and the, the <laughs> Voigtkampf. Again, another German word that neither is going to oh, pronounce, yes. oh, yes. the test where it is all about the eye. Um, sorry, there was a question just here. Uh, hi. hi, I just wanted to ask how, how effective you think the, uh, the technology, whether it be cameras, uh, um, you as a filmmaker using moving images, how effective do you think it's been at, at, at replicating visual experience? Um, so, do you mean uh, digital or or or? or um, uh, well, really, going yeah, going going I back think, into yeah, um, yeah an, no, an, very much analog cameras, lenses, and so on. Um, how uh, how how effective in terms of looking has a has, have those technologies been able to replicate our experience of seeing? Um, so I'm thinking particularly our kind of peripheral vision that's always excluded mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. um, conventional imaging, moving images, and so on. Uh, and so and so. Th from that, we're kind of when we're looking at an image, it's like we're sort of looking in into a window. There's a kind of a barrier. There's a sort of disconnection there. Uh, there's something that's lost from the actual experience of of seeing and looking. Yeah, I mean, I think in 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 most ways, cameras are very primitive compared to human eyes. You know, as we know, when you first get a camera, you move it around, and then you look at the footage, and you think, "That's I feel seasick," you know, because it's moving far too much because the camera doesn't have the image stabilization that our binocular system has. That our brain naturally, I'm doing, look, I'm looking around now, I don't feel sick, you know. Um, so um, they're very very primitive in some ways, but I think that there are um, other things that cameras can do that frankly we can't like we and with our eyes at least i can't in my eyes approximate the effect of an extremely long telephoto lens you know when you look at an image of greta garbo in the cinema in 1930s there are times when her eyelashes are in focus and her ears are out of focus a human eye i don't think can quite approximate it. it's so good at sort of finding focus everywhere and giving us a sense that everything's in focus like if i if i switch from you to this camera here and back again i don't really have a sense of pulling focus it just all seems roughly in focus to me whereas the the sensuality of shallow focus our eyes can't really do there's almost a kind of erotics of shallow focus that i think our eyes can't do so there's something about uh, lenses or multiple lenses in, for example, a telephoto lens, which is sort of remarkable. And also the VR, the VR um, camera, you know, there's something in that which feels new to me. So I think that mostly primitive cameras are compared to a human eye, but in some ways they're superior. 
Well, it feels, with, especially with VR hardware, the aim is to understand how the biological eye works so you can emulate reality. It needs to do this thing where it shows that there's depth, even though essentially what you've got in terms of the hardware is a screen about three yeah. inches from your face. Yeah. I mean, it's the first medium, at least I believe it's the first medium, where we're actually paying so much attention to the biological human eye to actually design the hardware to enable the immersion you may enable mm -hmm. the experience and i think a key word you say there's human i mean i would love to see like a horse for example or <laughs> or a fish well they put you know, chickens or a cat. in VR, imagine a ca it's cat's or cat's vision you know i would love i you know has anybody approximated that i don't know maybe they have and i don't know but like all these other living creatures a lot of them look better than we do they they are better at looking than we are um and so i would love to see that well do you, do you think there's a degree of failure of imagination when it comes to to vr is 360 video so 360 video tries to replicate the world as it's seen whereas true virtual reality as, as some uh, folks have written very very fluently about is is about creating new worlds about creating things that yes. we as humans have never seen have never looked at and that should be the 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 bastion of the yes. art that we're aiming for not just sticking a a five eye uh, go co a GoPro camera in the middle of a field and and then putting people into that experience. Yes, I agree with that. I think that you know all technology is underimagined. All technology could be could have have an advanced imagination. I would say actually it's terrible to say, but I would say all art forms, every single book that's ever written, every certain kind of single painting that's ever been painted, including Don Quixote and uh, uh, um, Picasso's uh, Demoiselle d'Avigno, is underimagined. It could even be better. But not this book. <laughs> this is over -imagined. There's a question right at the front. Yeah. There's a question just here, and then we'll come to the we'll come to the front. Yep. Oh no, we'll go we'll go here, and then we'll come to. Yeah, the Hello. It's really beautifully about the poetics of light. Oh yes. And I also love the um, essay "Street Haunting" by Virginia <gasps> Woolf. Yes. And in it, she says, "Walking in the evening hour." Are, are you remembering this, this off by heart, no, or have I, you just I, looked I, it up? I've just been writing. Ju just pretend. This is in Wikipedia. Just, really, just she pretend says, that you know it off by heart. That's even walking better. Walking in the evening hour gives us the irresponsibility which darkness and lamplight bestow. Oh my we God. are no longer quite ourselves. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on the poetics of darkness. Yes, I do. Of course, as you can imagine. Yeah, that's so beautiful. You know, I think that what happened when you look at the illumination in cities. You know, there's some beautiful images of London when when um, gaslighting first came in, and and what you got was pools of light interspersed with darkness. And when you look at these images, I, I looked at them recently again, and I thought, what is this reminding me of? What does this remind me of? And it's rock pools. And, you know, it's a weird sort of metaphor I'm, I'm trying to suggest here, but like, you, you, and when you look into a rock pool, there's a microcosm, there's loads of things going on, and then in between it's dry, and then here's another rock pool with more. And I think the sort of dryness in between is, is that kind of something like that darkness you know and i said to repeat that phrase that i used from godard earlier on darkness is out of sight by uh, out of frame by other means that's superb i think so it's out of out of frame even though there might be something there but it's too dark to see it might as well be off stage you know so i think the the kind of darkness is you know darkness it's it's as we know it's scary you know hence all the darkness in david lynch etc but it's also got these mystical properties, the Mark Rothko paintings, and then some of the rooms, look how low the lighting is in those rooms. So you can feel the in, there's something ineffable. There's something just beyond. There's, there might be something out there. You know, even to say that sounds like either Close Encounters or God. You know, so darkness is, you know, fantastic, you know. Sorry, I was very feeble ending to my answer. <laughs> darkness is fantastic. Woo! <laughs> Hi. Uh, looking forward to reading the book. Thanks. Um, something about the sensationalism of, of technology, of looking, two things came to mind. One was Bill Viola. Oh, so yes. He talks about the, dumb, the camera being a dumb eye. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's only as good as the mind behind it. And mm -hmm. I think that gets lost a lot in the, what we're talking about in the kind of mediated world. There's a lot of dumbness behind the camera. Mm -hmm. The other one was Chris Marker in Sans Soleil, where he says... You know, he's been all around the world. He's had all these extraordinary, but the only thing he's interested in is banality. Yes, and yes. What, I I, what I'm concerned about is the that that technology kind of magnifies, sensationalizes looking, 
But as an artist, actually, I'm interested at looking at that which is very everyday and ordinary and in front of you without sensationalizing. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems we're increasingly sensationalized. I think it's a kind of pornographic drive in many ways to see more, to see more extreme, maybe VR, you know. I'm just not, I'm not entirely we, sure where we, that's going. That I, I'm not sure I want to go there. And I, the, I, I would agree with you that probably more sensational imagery than there has ever been. Or, well, maybe I agree with that. But is that the technology's fault? Is it? Or is is no, technology just technology. value neutral? Isn't it just a mm, kind of? Neutral? I'm not sure it's value neutral, but it, yeah, but it is reality of how it's being used. Yeah. And one other thing, did you did you see the story in the paper the other day? I don't know if anybody else has seen it about the new Chinese surveillance system? No. It's pretty extraordinary. Basically, what they're talking about, and they already they already have millions of people who voluntarily signed up for this. This mm. is the most extraordinary thing. Uh, it's it, it's a system whereby data from from all your devices would be collated, and citizens would receive a mark, a, a, a number between two fifty and seven fifty. I think it was. I you know about this, mm. and and that that grading of people would entitle them, if they got a high grade, entitle them to privileges in society. No. Yes. And if you get a low, if you get a low mark, if you start getting a low mark, you obviously you're in trouble. I and mean, this is actually happening. People are actually signing up voluntarily in their millions to uh, that's test a cast, this. That's a, vision, that's a cast system. They're talking about rolling it out within two years. So um, there's your dystopia right there. <laughs> In terms of looking, yeah, I mean, and and yeah, I mean, that's terrible. Completely agree. Uh, just like I agree with the point about the advertising, you know, and I, yeah, and we can, you know, you can probably get a sense from me. I would like to talk about the potential of something or the uh, imaginative reach of something. But you're right to talk about the other stuff as well. You know, Cor Corbusier said that the technology is the poetics. So maybe technology isn't entirely neutral. A, a, a piece of technology has some poetic implications i would say and so the the thing if you if you're interested in the creative aspect of human life which i am broadly then you ask yourself what can this do how can this improve our lives how can this give us more fun how can this improve society how can this expand our mind in some way how can this make us connect with other human beings these are old world questions these are timeless questions and yeah absolutely absolutely how can we stop stop them getting their hands on it of course just another question at the back. So when Hi. I was a kid, uh, we got a textbook and it said there are five senses. And, and it, I think it was a science textbook. So we were sort of told. But I can't imagine ever seeing something without hearing, without, you know, all these things. You can't imagine driving a car and not being able to hear. If I suddenly couldn't hear, I would be like, oh, no. And so in my, one sense, this is kind of a tough question. because And you're probably not going to agree because uh, you've just written a book on looking. Is there any such thing as looking? Maybe can you imagine looking without the other senses? I, can, I I'm lucky enough to have other senses, but of course, lots of people don't. Lots of people can only see and nothing else, and so it certainly exists in the world. You know, there are lots of people who can see but can't hear, or you know. So it's certainly possible to um, imagine isolating the senses. And in this book, that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to say, what if we screen out the other senses and only ask the question, what is looking? But you know, in the end, what I'm m most interested in is the relationship to with looking and these political questions, the relationship between looking and thinking, the relationship between looking and ethics, the relationship between looking and pleasure, you know, to its sort of hybridity, the kind of miscegenated aspect of looking. So, so you're right. When you, talk, you talked about the, the image of the looking going out. Yes. And coming back in. Yes. And that all, so, I mean, it seems like inside, if, I, I love that image. I thought. It seems like inside the head there would be a lot more that was going out than just looking that had come in. Absolutely. And, but sometimes, you know, it's good to isolate one thing in order to understand it, and then we can reintroduce it into the world. Let's say that this book extracts looking from the world and says, what is it of itself? And then we can say, well, let's reintroduce it into the world now that we've exposed it a little bit, something like that. And there was one other question at the back. Just Ava following Pesca. up for, for, for this question, uh, I remember the project that Luke was involved in uh, when you were the eyes of Stellark uh, and he was trying to function somehow seeing what Luke was seeing in New York while Stellark was hanging 
in his body of the gallery somewhere in London. And I remember his comment about it is that it really was massively uncomfortable experience, not so much because Luke was getting up to all no good things in the New York, ever. but yeah. more about the impact of not seeing what his body was doing and the relationship between the lack of sight and his <coughs> body and the discomfort that that was creating. I think he, he normally puts up with a lot of discomfort with all his stellar key adventures, but it was quite striking that the the separation between looking and the body mm -hmm. he thought was quite mm -hmm. out there with wrong yeah, yeah it's very interesting you know just just to give a little context yeah. on that project essentially it was a, a performance artist called Stellark had uh it was gonna sit for six hours in a gallery and you were able to control his body through a web interface and his eyes were essentially we, we tried to live stream but six hours of raw footage of a GoPro strapped to my chest and his ears were in New York, so the audio didn't match. No, oh my The visuals God. didn't match with the, how his body was being controlled. So I think, I think what Ava was trying to allude to was what happens when all of these things don't match, where there's a disconnection between looking and sound, when we have this Very issue interesting. where our, our sensory uh, organs don't always uh, translate what we expect uh, or at least what our brain has learnt to expect, and I suppose that goes back to VR. VR, I mean, yeah. that's a place where we can really play yeah. with the yeah. sensory organs. Yeah, and, and the, absolutely. Well, that sounds fascinating. But you know, there's a simple thing that w I, f I noticed that I enjoy dancing more when I close my eyes, but I can't see where I am. It's probably just sort of inhibition, you know. But, but like when you dance, so you can't see what your body's doing. And so it sort of goes slightly more into autopilot. You know, it, it, probably my dancing gets worse, but it feels as if it gets better, you know. And so there's certainly th th that kind of thing. If you remove looking from the equation, it, your body can do other things, I think, you know. And converse, you know, if you turn if you turn your body into a thing that's looked at, you know, then some interesting stuff can happen there as well. I'm, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative for the very last question and just ask, uh, what must a filmmaker know about looking or what should a filmmaker take from this sort of book in order to leverage leverage a human's ability to look for the most creative outcome uh, the, the answer to that question is I think it's really good to know all the other images that have been made on the subject and then try and do something that they haven't done you know I think that so it's possible to make good films without having seen loads and loads of imagery um, but it's you make something better if you have. Try to make a film in New York, for example. It's it's really quite hard because it's been filmed every which way. Um, but the, uh, the, if you make a really good film, it'll be a new thing. It'll be a new type of imagery. It'll be um, it'll be like a n there is, there is such a thing as a new image. It's very hard to do. But I think that's the most important thing you need to know. So on that note, I hope that this audience will never see things <laughs> the same way again. And it has been an uncuttable conversation. <laughs> I'm going to say that. We'll release the whole thing and we'll, we'll, we'll hand it over to Gannon Gate. I just, want, I just want to do a couple of thank yous. Firstly, um, I want to thank the Library Club. Uh, they're so incredibly kind to us. We, As of last week, we've locked in 2018, so we're looking to do many of these sorts of events throughout um, next year in this, in this beautiful venue. Um, books can be purchased at the back, and if you pre-ordered a book through Eventbrite, um, those are available uh, for collection. I, I highly recommend the book, and um, I, I'm I'm not just saying that. There's some books where I'm like, Jesus, that was, <laughs> that was a rough book. That was a great conversation. That was a rough book. This is a this is a great book, and it was a great uh, uh, conversation. It is um it is a book for people who like books with pictures. So really, it's a book for <laughs> for another one, also known as children. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I'm not going to. Um, so look, uh, I, I also want to thank the volunteers for helping us tonight to, be, to Ben Greenaway, who's been a, who's been part of VF for 20, God knows how many years, who's who supplied some of the VR uh, kit, and to, to Jack, who's kindly helped with the with the filming. Uh, we're entirely audience funded, so if you love what we do, please support us on Patreon, or just find out more about us uh, through Virtual Futures pretty much everywhere online. And I want to end this how we end every single virtual futures and in the theme of mark's book if you if you feel comfortable i would like you to turn to the individual next to you and just stare at them in the eyes <laughs>
<laughs> I thought you were going to say let's end with a song. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> well, you know, we're going to end with Irish Shetty. But, uh, <laughs> so if you, if you feel comfortable, and there's no, there's no need, but if you feel comfortable, please turn to the person next to you. <laughs> That's and, a great idea. That's <laughs> and listen to this very careful warning. And all of you are looking at me, so blow that. Uh, so this is the warning we end every virtual futures with, and it's this. The future is always virtual. You know, many things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes, and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. The bar is now open. Please join me in thanking the incredible Mark Cousins. <laughs> Thank you, I think.